So um, we'll start with the photos and slideshow presentation. I got a little bit of history um, of the tool and then uh, goes into um, some of my experiences with the tool and, and how I've come to sort of a, an understanding, at least from my own point of view on, on you know, the tools design and use. And um, then I'll do a, a demonstration, um, just talk about how they work. And, you know, all of this is really for uh, you all to, to help you to design uh, crooked knives that'll work well. Um, when I first got into them, uh, there's a lot of, it, you know, just slapdash information on the internet. And a lot of times, uh, from what I've found, which I'll get into, the handles shape were, were very poorly designed and caused me a lot of physical pain. And um, so this is all to help folks like make good crooked knives so that you can use them. Um, and that's why we'll put it on YouTube so that people can uh, have access to this. Um, all right, so I'm gonna screen share and get going here. Okay. All right, so the crooked knife or uh, otherwise known as Mokotagan. Um, that word Mokotagan is a uh, Algonquin native, Algonquin lang language family. Um, here in Ojibwe territory, it was known as Wagikoman. Um, and again, that's one of those subjects that could go on and on linguistically. Um, generally, it, it's, it uh, means crooked knife. Um, uh, the French also had a name, uh, was it uh, Couteau Croche? Again, crooked knife. Um, you see that a lot with, with different tools. They're just named in a sort of descriptive way. All right, why is this? Okay, there we go. So to start off, um, some of this uh, information um, I've gathered is, is from a great book, which is listed in the resource uh, page that Jasmine mentioned, um, called Mokotagan, and uh, it was written by uh, the Jalberts. It's a free download, um, and again, it's, you can get access to it, but probably one of the best um, uh, published books, you know, on the subject. And so, you know, to talk about this knife or this tool, we need to, we need to talk about um, technology. And you know, early man, our ancestors, <clears throat> um, our uh, you know, stone was one of the first tools. So, can you see my cursor? Yeah, you can. Okay. So you know, these first tools were were flaked stone, napped, and you know, I was thinking about it this morning when laying in bed, like if you had your hand wrapped around this piece of stone here and you wanted to cut with it, you know, and, and maybe being a, a woodworker most of my life, you know, I understand how these tools work. Um, it would make more sense to pull it toward you. You'd have more grasping power on that tool, that, that piece of stone. And, you know, you could just draw it toward you instead of trying to cut away um, you couldn't see maybe a little less, less control. So it's, it's a pretty natural, uh, I think, to think about pulling tool, tools toward us to cut. Um, you know, and then this, the second photo here, I think that one, they say that's a speculative tool. I don't know if that's based on a real find. Um, but again, attaching some sort of wooden handle to things makes, makes it easier probably you'd get less cut on your hand, maybe you wrapping it in skin or something first or some thick plant. And then, uh, you know, they say here, number C, the second major advance, um, more a more fixed uh, blade handle. They found that um, in the Southwest and, you know, some of this stuff is still just theory, you know, um, 
I'm not convinced that that's you know what they what they think it is, but it definitely is is definitely a a, a stone tool with a wooden handle. Um, and then we move on to D and E, the beaver tooth, right? So if you've studied or looked into this tool, the beaver tooth is always kind of tied to to its design or maybe even its origins. Um, I used to trap beaver and I've, I've dealt with beaver teeth quite a bit and they're very sharp. Um, and so it would make sense even observing the animal and what they do with their teeth that it might work good for, for cutting wood. Um, but, you know, thinking of it more as a gouge than a, a pulling knife, you know, you'd have to use the side of the tooth, which isn't sharp, the teeth are hollow um, and fragile. So as a gouge, I, I would I would say that's that's what those beaver teeth were were more used for than a pulling knife. <clears throat> and then and then the first Mokotagan, which is tied to um, well tied to iron and steel. And so here in North America, you know the people living here, you know went from the Stone Age to the Iron Age and like a generation, I suppose, compared to everywhere else in the world where, you know, it, it's, it, it spread slowly and through other ages. Of course, they had copper um, and bone stone, but not, they weren't forging iron. Um, so with the European contact in the early 1500s, steel, steel started to spread around and, and um, you know, people learned how to forge it. And, and fashion it into blades. You know, it's, it's probably one of the best materials around for cutting wood. So that was when they adopted uh, this drawing knife type wood cutting uh, technique, uh, technology into metal blades. And then of course, then it evolved even further into, you know, the Mokotagan as art which is the Jawbirds book, if you get a copy of it. And I do have some photos in my presentation from the book, but they were very highly decorated, uh, not all the time, but so they were maybe a kind of a cultural object, I suppose, or a personal object. You know, we decorate things that we have, we find value in. Um, so, so that's a little bit of the brief history. Uh, I don't like to dwell on that stuff too much because you know a lot of it is just in the past, and I'm not I'm not a professional historian or archaeologist. So I'm a woodworker, and um, that's sort of my interest is is just how to use great tools for 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 making things, and these things tie us to the land and and all that all that stuff. Here you see. Um, uh, sort of this draw knife culture, one-handed draw knife culture through uh, Siberia across into the northern areas of North America. Um, I've seen a bunch of different documentation and, and, and videos of reindeer herding people in Siberia. Um, they also have these, these single beveled draw knife traditions. Um, even the Laplanders or the Sami um, have them as well. So um, that's just a little bit of, of, of uh, thinking about things as, as like pan-global or across the Northern hemisphere. We have this sort of commonality with this tool. I've been woodworking for a little, almost 30 years and I've, spent a lot of time researching in my younger days. This is pre-internet. So I've got my hand on this book, which for me, and, and I know some of you here um, know Drew personally or have taken classes with him, but um, this is just a, a paramount experience looking at this book uh, as a young man in the 90s. And in it, you can see at the top, it's the Indian crooked knife, um, Swedish spoon carving knife, Sloyd knife, chip knife, and the bill hook. And, um, you know, that was my first exposure to this tool and what, what it was, you know, and he doesn't really go into it much at all. Um, but, you know, as a, as a 
young man trying to get into woodworking and, and having this hand tool uh, ethos. And I was really fascinated by this, but I, you know, I didn't have internet access to, to find information. And so it was a really slow and I kind of just let it, let it go. Here in Northern Wisconsin or the Great Lakes region, again, this is tied to the steel uh, and the traveling of steel and trade goods. Um, you know, we have the fur trade, the Europeans, you know, started to, to seek uh, alliances with different native tribes and tribal groups. And the French, uh, you know, were allied with the Algonquin people. And, you know, where I reside over here, this maps from the 1700s in, in Shawamagan Bay, um, where the Ojibwe and Algonquin keep speaking people. Um, so with the fur trade and these alliances became, you know, steel, steel uh, was used and, and that technology. And so it, it would spread pretty quickly and pretty early on um, uh, post uh, contact with Europe. Here's a modern map for those of you who don't have a clear picture of the United States in your, in your mind. Um, so where I live is right here, sort of near the Western shores of, of Lake Superior and the Great Lake chain. This uh, kind of commemorates uh, a spot right here. This is just down, down the street by the water uh, from my house. Uh, two Frenchmen um, traveled west uh, in the 1650s and made contact with a lot of uh, the native people around the Great Lakes to, to set up um, trade with, for beaver. And these guys were part of the, the formation of the Hudson Bay Company, which is a big, powerful organization at the time. Um, and again, there's books written on just the history of that uh, scene. Um, and so, you know, the reason I share this is just, it's, it's part of my area. Um, and the Great Lakes region and, and the fur trade and birch bark canoes in particular are all tied to this knife. Um, it's also known as a canoe knife. And there were, I don't know exactly, but I'm sure there were thousands and thousands of birch bark canoes plying the waters around here in native populations and in, in these big fur trade boats that they built for moving furs from, from one side of the Great Lakes to the other. <clears throat> and so this is a, a painting from uh, Frances Hopkins, a woman who is sitting in this boat here. Her husband was a uh, kind of a high up guy in the, in the uh, I don't know if it was the Hudson Bay Company or not, but a high up in one of the fur trade companies and she traveled with him one summer and, and there's a, a pile of her paintings, a very, uh, very well done, very nice. Um, of that era and fur trade stuff. So in Jalbert's book, um, they dug up the first mention of the word Mokotagan in English. Um, the French, I said, had, had their name for it. Um, and uh, it was a trade good. So this was in uh, 1748. Um, so, you know, fairly early on, I guess when you're thinking about trade into the fringes of civilization or the fringes of uh, the new world or, or whatever way you wanna look at it. Um, here is uh, a few photos of giant replicas of uh, these uh, fur trade boats. This is up at Grand Portage in Northern Minnesota where there was a fur trade post. It's hard to see in the photo, but you know this this canoe down sitting normally as it would, you know, it's almost thirty feet. These things could haul tons of beaver and gear as people moved across the water. So the crooked knife is tied to canoe building, um, and it it really is for me uh, as well. Um, you know, the natives were were carving wood; they were wood culture. Everything they used was was tied to that resource, um, 
and uh, Native communities feast a lot and, and feasts are big ceremony, uh, bring the communities together and celebrate, you know, the, you know, the, the hard life that you live and eat together and share food. Um, so this, this is an example of a native ladle, uh, feast ladle. And for those food carvers uh, here, you can kind of see that the, the design is a little bit different than the, like the kind of common Swedish uh, design. But the, but yeah, I, I'm not gonna go into that. Yeah, and cradle boards, another example of, of a native uh, object that was made from wood. This is what you would um, swaddle your children in. You know, and again, it would be ribbon wood, um, axed out, and then and then crooked knife down, shaved down to thin sections where they could then bend and and lash this thing together. Um, I used to make these and teach this here in the northern Wisconsin at the different tribal community centers. So here's a photo of a typical. Um, crooked knife that and, and how the blade was fixed. Of course, there's a, any way you can think of doing it was done. Um, but the most common way is this blade and its tang has a little bend in the, in the very end. You know, so drilling into end grain handle uh, would be very challenging to get accurate. Maybe you could burn it in arguably. Um, but instead, you could take your uh, small chisel or, or your knife, straight knife, and just carve that slot, put a wooden plug in over it, and then lash it with, with whatever you could, string, um, fiber, uh, duct tape, you know, which happens in the modern times, wire, um, and then you could replace the blade easily as well. Um, here's another diagram. That first diagram is from uh, Henry Valancourt's book, Making the Atikamekw Snowshoe. This one is from uh, Adney's book called The Bark Canoes and Skin Boats of North America that he did with Howard Chappelle. Um, so here's another picture. And so these are some of the first photos that I saw uh, with detail. There's a, a few other kind of Boy Scout uh, kind of stuff where they have pictures of or illustrations of crooked knives. And, you know, to go from this, uh, how do I make one of these, you know? So early on, let's see, in my teaching days, um, um, I made snowshoes and, and spoons, toboggans, and and fascinated by hand tools. Uh, I've had some pretty great experiences working with timber framing and blacksmithing and basketry, uh, formative experiences to sort of help me and give me confidence. And like, all right, I'm gonna make a bunch of knives as I went along and, and, um, and of course shared and taught what I was learning. So I was really fascinated with these elbow adzes for a long time. Um, it could be another talk, um, but you can see here a couple different crooked knives. There's five there. Um, and so early on, I, I made the first one. I don't have a photo of it. It's probably really bulky and the thumb rest wasn't in a good spot. And it probably just really caused me a lot of pain to try to use it. Um, so I, you know, had to go deeper, like, all right. So I started experimenting with handle and thumb rest and blade sort of orientation. So this is probably like the second knife I made here. Um, really short um, blade, but, but really extreme thumb rest. And, um, you know, I learned some things. I, you know, abandoned it after a while because it's not that great, but I grabbed some just just some random curved antler and put a blade on it. That wouldn't probably work the least well. 
And um, this one with the uh, fish tail is inspired by the late Bill Copperthwaite in his book, Handmade Life. Um, there's a photo of a similar one, more for carving, uh, like gouging has a really extreme curve to it. And then these two on the left were sort of moving in the direction that I am now, um, where I started to sort of get them to work well. So this is in my younger days. I've made a lot of like ribbon snowshoes and would demonstrate, go to traditional skills and uh, winter camping symposiums, trying to get people to use traditional gear, um, making snowshoes and teaching. So this is one of my students up at the uh, Porcupine Mountain School, Folk School in Northern Michigan making a snowshoe stave, which is the main piece that gets bent around to make the main form. And through observation of teaching and watching how people interact with the tool too helped inform um, some ideas on design. So um, in, uh, when was it? 2006, I built my first birch bark canoe with a good friend of mine, uh, Joe Ugolano, on the shores of Lake Superior at a traditional skills event that, that we had we'd organized. It's a very small hunter's canoe. Um, what time is it, Jasmine? It's 11.26. Okay. I'm trying to get this light out of here. <laughs> so um, I really learned a lot building building the canoe with the, with the crooked knife right like everything was split and riven and um and and draw knife down into into its final shape before the uh, canoe was assembled and that's something to mention here um the way the style of woodworking you know it's a green woodworking um we work with fresh timber um logs <clears throat> Uh, some limbs, branches, just raw, pure raw material of, of trees. And, and we split them down with wedges um, and then take an ax and hew them to a smaller shape or further split. And then the final stage would be to use the crooked knife to uh, plane the surfaces to uniform thickness, uh, width, and, and smoothness. And so they're really like a one-handed draw knife. Um, you can see this, this old, old man here making snowshoe frames. Um, and uh, the beauty of the tool is that it's very portable. You can just sit and uh, start working. You need an ax and uh, a club made out of wood and, and your crooked knife, maybe a straight knife. Everybody had straight knives for cooking and eating with. So it's a real uh, mobile toolkit. You can just travel around with the, all that stuff in your pack and you can pretty much make anything you need, um, including canoes or bows, uh, snowshoes for walking in the deep snow, canoe paddles, uh, and of course the tikkanogans and uh, cradle boards, the spoons and bowls, uh, very versatile tool. Um, it's said that uh, in some of the accounts when, when the Europeans were, were meeting natives in, in communities that they call these men's knives. Um, I would imagine it's because of the division of labor in, in those societies and um, these men would have six, seven different crooked knives, um, all for different tasks. <clears throat> so that leads me to think that, you know, there may not be a uh, one size fits all, uh, in particular, just the handle shape and size. These knives were highly customized for the user based on their experience of using them and growing up with them on a daily basis. Uh, that's really important to factor in. And so then we also 
uh, know that they would make multiple knives for, for these different tasks. And so, you know, as I went on to explore design and trying to make a better knife, you know, I, I considered these things that I was learning along the way or, or gaining insight to. Um, Moise's knife, there's a photo of it somewhere. I didn't include it. It almost has a straight handle. It doesn't even have much of a tool rest or a thumb rest at all. And I'll get into how these knives work in a few minutes, but it really set off uh, an idea in my mind that the thumb rests that I were seeing were, were too extreme. Excuse me. Gary is kind of trimming uh, a snowshoe frame that's already bent. So I, went on to develop uh, new handle designs. And you can see, uh, you know, they're lashed, traditionally lashed and put together like the original ones, but not as extreme as that first set, if you remember, a um, little bit more shallow. Um, that thumb rest is important. As you're cutting, um, the, the blade pivots on that cut the knife wants to pivot on the cut and the thumb rest prevents that from happening. And the, the fulcrum, I guess, is the, is, I guess that's where the pivot is, is that, you know, the pinky finger, ring finger. And so you need that, um, you need that as the, as the knife wants to uh, tweak in your hand, that thumb rest prevents it, allows you to make a nice cut. It's really important to have a thumb rest in, in the right spot. And I went on to make a few more canoes. This is my friend Patrick from here from Bad River. He helped me build two. I was also making a lot of basket parts. Another thing these knives are good for. Um, my ex-wife was a black ash basket weaver. And so I would assist her in pounding the logs and also making all the handles and rims for the baskets. So she'd set me up with a few baskets she wanted uh, fitted. And then I would go to work with uh, mostly white ash, you know, ribbon, fresh green wood was the best. And you can just bend it green. You don't need to steam it or anything. So here I am in my uh, yurt, um, a few years ago, I got rid of all my power tools, save for a few, put them in storage and went into just hand tool only um, for a few years, just to see what it would be like. Here's a photo of a few of her baskets with some handles. So out East, a lot of the native tribes, you know, the basket, ash basket traditions are, are very strong and um, there's always a crooked knife around when it comes to working handles and stuff like that. Although people did adopt shave horses and, and the two-handed western draw knives, um, spoke shaves as well, but um, crooked knives still play an important role in, in the basket making. Uh, when was this? 2014, uh, a good friend of mine, Robin Wood, a uh, fellow pole turner and a mentor for me on, on that, um, came over and helped build uh, a bark canoe with me. So here's a kind of a great example of, of crooked knives in use. Um, I didn't have very many photos of those early days. So we have us sh shaving and trimming uh, gunnel stock for a canoe, the canoe we built. It was a 14 foot canoe. So we get these logs, split them down, um, ax them if need be, and then go to work with the uh, crooked knives, turning them into, into gunnels. And you can see in back more stock laying there, piles and piles and piles of, of lovely smelling cedar shavings. Um, we uh, also, you know, split the ribs for the canoe and the sheathing that goes on the inside underneath the ribs between the ribs and the bark. And again, ribbon, cedar, um, and uh, 
use your crooked knife to, to make them into the shapes you'd like. Uniform thickness for easy bending. And this is really where this knife really shines is, is as a draw knife, long draw knife cuts. So for canoe parts, snowshoe parts in particular, you know, those cradle board parts, um, uh, wooden shovels, which the Northern Cree used. I made a bunch of those uh, that, that it works great as well. And again, we split first, then, then shave. And I don't know if everybody's familiar with bark canoes, so I wanted to kind of put in a few of these photos just so you can see the ribs go in, help shape the hull, and then they get removed and then a, a thin cedar sheathing gets put in and the ribs get put back in into their final position. And they get all made with a crooked knife, split cedar, uh, split root lashing. And here's Robin, quite, quite proud. And then the year later, we went and took it up to the Boundary Waters, um, a really great place in northern Minnesota, a pure wilderness. And um, we went for a five day trip with his apprentice, who is in the front of that kayak, and his good friend um, from Milwaukee. I forget his name off the top of my head. And when we went for five days, I took a 1930s uh, wood canvas canoe. Here's the last uh, canoe I built uh, in 2015 with a guy from the Yukon. So, we'll get into the knives a little bit more now that we know what they're good for and how to use them. But we'll look at some photos first. So here's a, uh, three of my uh, crooked knives that I used. These two bottom ones I still own and use today. And I don't know where this one went. I must have given it away to somebody. Um, one of the things that I'll talk about a little bit more in detail or show you is that the handle has the thumb rest and then the blade is kind of kinked a little bit too. And it can go uh, kinked in this direction like the bottom one or um, if you can see me, the, the blade can be kinked back as well. And that's kind of what they're saying they think why crooked knives are called crooked knives. It's not so much the curved tip of the blade because we find probably more people, uh, more knives, I should say, uh, with straight blades. So it can't be the blade itself. It has, to, it has to be how the blade is affixed to the handle or maybe the handle. Who really knows? So here's some that I, uh, used to make and sell, I would take custom orders, get people's hand measurements, because I'm convinced that they need to fit your hand um, to work well. Do you see that someone's trying to get in, Jasmine? Um, so I would, I would take people's measurements and then make these blades. And then instead of the traditional lashing, you know, nowadays we have drills and fancy drill bits and epoxy. So I just drill and mount the tang into the wood like we would any, any normal sloid or carving knife. And so here we have some uh, historical pieces and we can kind of see some of the fancy, some of the fancy decorations and, um, and, and how they were put together. This is bound with wire. You can see that the knife is inserted into the back of the handle and then wired on. This is all from the Jalbert's book. And arguably, you know, I don't know if all of these were really working tools or not. You know, we don't know this for sure, um, possibly. 
Some might have been for show or for sale, you know. A lot of times the iron was made from uh, old uh, straight razors um, and or recycled steel from other blades, um, reforged and reworked. You know, that's the beauty of, of blacksmithing is that you can reshape that metal in lots of ways. You can layer it and weld it and turn it into something else entirely. Um, and, you know, these native tool makers, you know, could easily, easily did that type of work once hammers and, and things like that started to spread around. And again, they were a trade item as well. And there's a fair amount of these with the blade mounted in the back, you know, which arguably is less than ideal if the blade wants to go that way, but, but that's the way they did it. That's likely a straight razor. This one has a really interesting triangular handle shape, which I'm going to get into later. And so does this one. They inset that blade with, with uh, probably lead. Pewter. So if you really get your hands on the Jalbert's book, you know, there's, I don't remember hundreds of them, uh, photos in there. And, and a lot of them are, you know, highlighting the art of the crooked knife. I myself am more of a down and dirty, you know, let's just use them and not so much with the fancy stuff, but still, these are the examples that we have to look at. And what I'm interested in is this relationship of the thumb rest, the handle size and shape, and the way the blade is mounted uh, in relation to the handle, not into the handle, but how it's related to the handle. Uh, this knife was up for auction at North House. My friend Fred, in, you know, like we can't auction that off. That has to go to a museum. So I think they pulled them out of the auction. And there's another one. This one's a really sweet user. Um, with a really extreme hook on the end. So, you know, what was this straight one used for and what was that curved one used for if people had multiple uh, knives in their toolbox, so to speak. So one for hollowing, one for, for canoe parts or snowshoe parts. Um, my one of my last classes before COVID hit was in Portland and uh, one of my students brought this one in for me. A really nice, um, really nice handle and blade cut really well. I think his relative has acquired it somewhere out east, but <clears throat> and I'll get into this, but what I really like about this is this tool rest. Um, and this handle is, has this sweep on it. It's all these things that I think make a, a good working knife. <clears throat> so from the knives that I've, I've seen and used, you know, there are some that are exceptional from what I, what I define as a good knife. And of course, anything will work, but um, does it work well? <clears throat> you can see here, the palm is open as you're pulling. The, the, the blade is, is grabbing the wood here. And the, the knife wants to pivot. And so the thumb rest is extended um, in a comfortable way. It's not overextended to the side where you can't actually push against the handle. It's, it's extended in a forward motion or more in line with the forearm. And then the palm is a, has a loose grip that um, allows for that thumb rest to engage properly. Sometimes you see images or photos of people holding their really large handled knives 
tightly in their hands and their thumb is overextended to the side. And if you try that sometime, it, it, the, the thumb doesn't have any power when it's extended like that. The thumb has a power when it's pointed straight up in line. And the only way to get that knife in, in, engaged then in your hand is to have either a really long handle, wide handle, or to loosen your grip and let your palm open a little bit. And so these, this, this uh, idea I have or concept of design, you know, was, was tipped off with Moise Flamin, the native guy making snowshoes in, this is the last slide, so I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, exit. Okay. Um, just give me a second here. If you guys have questions, make sure you send them to Jasmine and not me. Someone sent this to me. Right. Someone made a statement here. Uh, uh, what works good is better than what looks good, because what works good lasts, reigns. Um, so <clears throat> thinking about how these tools work, reading that, uh, making the Atikamek Snowshoe by Henry Valancourt, um, probably one of the most well-known and best canoe builders, uh, birch bark canoe builders today. I think he's in New Hampshire. And he documented some natives building these snowshoes in the late 70s, early 80s. And Moise's knife, that knife that had such a straight handle, really uh, kind of got me thinking about things um, instead of these big extreme handles. Um, Moise and his wife were caretakers at wind, uh, like a winter logging camps and stuff. And uh, they'd spend the winters crafting and then what they made, they would sell for extra income. And they would make up to 70 sets of snowshoes a winter, along with tanning moose hides, making cradle boards and other things. To be able to make that many, to me, means that that knife did not cause him physical pain. And again, we could go into personal constitution, um, diet, right? People of that era we're eating a lot of really rich foods high in collagen and, and all that stuff that we kind of tend to avoid today um, fish head soup and and you know boiled knuckles and uh, moose tongue and things like that um, all that stuff is super delicious and super good for you um, and probably allowed a, you know a certain amount of elasticity in his tendons and stuff but he still made 70 of them a year. It's a lot of shaving. And I'm thinking about his knife being such as uh, almost a straight handle. The tool rest was in a perfect position really. And, and then um, weighing that experience with uh, what I was experimenting with in my younger days, making these crazy curved handles, the crooked knives just wouldn't work. They would, I would have to grip them with my fist and then the thumb was sort of just a symbolic gesture. And because I was squeezing so hard to make these knives work, my wrist would get inflamed and you're just pulling along with just your fist. Why even have that thumb rest if it's not gonna work? And so Moise, that, that whole documentation of Moise Fleming got me really thinking about the design of these tools and, and where to put the thumb rest more over than anything else. Um, so, and then how it fits in our hand. So we have uh, my, main, my main working knife here. And I'll show you in use, um, but you know, like that photo, your palm is open and now your thumb can be extended and actually very easily push against that to counter, counter the pivot. Um, versus holding it really tight in your hand, like, like a fist, the only way to control that would be to squeeze and use these muscles. And, and our wrists aren't that great for that. Um, 
these these two fingers, the pinky and the ring finger, are have the strongest tendons, um, and they're really made for gripping. Um, so we we can we can really squeeze with those and not hurt ourselves. And I learned some of this from physical therapists and stuff over the years. We have this extended. The other key is the the shape of the handle cross section. So. You know, when looking at this shape of my open palm, and it's it's kind of triangular, it's not round. So we want a crooked knife to be to fit that. There's a couple of people kind of coming in. I got it. Um, to fit that comfortably, and that's going to allow for the most control for depth of cut. So those are the two, the key things that I've, I put into my knives is, is that cross section and a thumb rest that isn't as extreme so that I can keep my palm open and, and reach the thumb rest instead of if it was really crooked and I don't have any of those old examples I've tossed them, but um, if, you, if your hand, if, you're, if your thumb rest is really crooked you're going to have to grasp further down in your palm to get your thumb up into that position. And then again, you're going to be squeezing more. Your thumb rest may, it may be extended and it may work, but um, I'm not saying that it won't, but it's really important to think about it. The worst would be a, a thumb rest that forces your thumb too far out. Then you have no power to control uh, just to stop the fulcruming action. And, you know, I learned that through a little bit of experience. So this is one of the earlier knives that I made and I used quite a bit. Um, this section here is a little bit too wide for my hand. And it, 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 it works okay. Um, and, but this cross section is, uh, too large in, in cross section, too big a diameter. It doesn't fit in my hand very well. And without those facets, it's more round. Um, it, it rolls around a little bit more, harder to hold on to. I have to squeeze harder to hold on to that round um, handle versus a triangular cross section that fits naturally in. Then I don't have to squeeze as hard. Yeah. The, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, post, post your comments to Jasmine. If anybody has any questions, you know, now would be time to kind of launch. We're going to do a little bit of a demo. Um, <clears throat> yeah, Jasmine put the link in for the book. It's, it's sometimes hard to get. Um, there's a bunch of different sites for free books, and sometimes you have to register, sometimes you have to pay. Um, like she said, I have the link to that in, in the resource PDF that's on the page that you registered for this talk. All right, Jasmine's going to turn on her phone and film. There she is. And then um, I'm going to shut my camera off. Leave my mic on. Yep, you're on the bottom. Make co host. And, oh, that's not the person. Wait, where did you go? Oh, you're at the top now. Be patient. Spotlight for everyone. Wait, move the pin videos. Okay, I'm getting some weird. Uh, okay, Jasmine. Why is it sideways? Is it sideways? Do, do, do. Flip your phone. Hmm. Yeah, maybe it did. All right, so. 
here we go with some demos. <clears throat> so here's one of the newer knives um, that I just made. I'll have a few of these up for grabs at the end of the talk. I'd like to use that for my demo, but then it'll be used. And I don't know, so. Okay. So, so how the knife works, you know, I already discussed it, um, but now I'll show. So we want that triangular section to fit, to fit our fingers. And then with the palm open, and maybe you want to swing around just a little bit. With the palm open, you know, that thumb needs to be extended a little bit. More in line with the, with the, with the forearm than, than perpendicular. And then as you engage the tool, I have some, some cedar here. The knife wants to pivot. And so that's what is fulcruming on that uh, pinky and ring finger. The index and middle finger help to steer. There's more nerves in these, thing, these two than these two, but they're not good for gripping. So, it's not as important for them to be engaged um, with their muscles, so to speak. And then the thumb is extended. And you can see I'm just relaxing my palm and pulling. I just have to push on my thumb a little bit. And because the cross section fits into my hand very well, I don't have to over squeeze to control the way the blade works in and out of the wood. So this is the position in which you work, you know, sitting on a chair or sitting on a stump. Um, and again, cedar, cedar is a pretty soft material, um, even when it's dry. But as I'm carving, just notice my palm. It's open. So on these knives, the reason why I have the tip curled is so it doesn't get in, in the way, doesn't carve the wood, it doesn't get stuck in the wood, especially making um, a canoe paddle. So the blades of those are fairly wide, wider than the knife, maybe a little as much as twice as wide. So you wouldn't want that end of the blade to get stuck in, in the wood if you're using all of your blade. Um, and this slight curve allows for a little bit more slicing action, I guess like a scalloping action on your cut. Um, there's different edge geometry, a steeper blade or a shallower, or a steeper bevel or shallower bevel will act differently on different woods. Um, if you have a lot of really curly figured wood, uh, not super curly, but then a steeper blade is going to work a little bit better, like kind of like a chip breaker, a little hand plane. Um, and then I have some dry, uh, some dry cherry here. So even even with the hard wood, all I'm doing is is kind of like like you're doing a pull-up, right? You're just hanging from that pull-up bar. It's not hard to do. And maybe because we're primates in a way, right? Like that's easy for us to hold on to. And so even with the hard wood, just thought of that. Even with that hard wood, I can't take huge shavings, but, um, I can still cut with my palm open. I don't have to squeeze it with my wrists to make this work. It's really open and relaxed. And you know, you can take small cuts and you'll still get the job done. You know, and remember these tools, you know, evolved um, 
with people who don't have the same concepts as time as we do, right? We don't have 20, you know, they didn't have 24 hour schedules and weekends only to craft on, you know, and it's really important also to think about, to think about that as well, right? Like the raw materials, you'd see all those shavings that I generated working on those canoes and it's a lot of material goes to shavings with these earlier technologies, but that's just the way it is. And um, time isn't such a factor, right? It takes as long as it takes to make the canoe. Um, so when we're working with this stuff as more modern people, um, and that not in a judgmental way do I say modern, our concepts of time, we're, we're, we're always hurried and we're always thinking or trying to fit things in, you know, for crafting, for hobby, or even the professional sense. This time is a, is a big factor and um, it can get in the way, especially when you're working and thinking about earlier tools, you know, so back to like small shavings. I could do this all day and not get fatigued. And this hard cherry, which is hard dry cherry, which is pretty hard, versus trying to muscle it in. Yeah. So we got a question about sharpening the blade, and I thought maybe you'd talk about that stuff, Jerry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A yeah. Bit. Do you want to switch over? Yeah, to I'll go bit? back there now. Um, and uh, we'll answer some questions because we're we're pretty much done with the demo. Uh, Turn my camera on. Yeah, okay, and I got a couple questions here. And I think I'm the main, yeah. main screen Can I, now. I'll, I'll share this with you as yeah. well. Um, so uh, Jeremy said, seems there's a slight skew based on the blade attachment. Yeah. And then uh, Eric says, is there no bevel on the bottom of the blade? Right, good questions. And Jared mentioned the bevel angle. What is the average angle he uses? 15 degrees or more? Yeah. Yeah. Single edge, double edge bevel. So those are the questions. So what I what I found, and you know, we could make the argument that everybody's different, but I don't know if that's that if if we're that different that that uh, some of this stuff wouldn't apply to everybody. I'd say the size of the handle and thumb rest location for smaller hands versus really large hands plays in. And I learned that through making them um, for people, sent me the, their dimensions. I had them measure their digits and their thumb and the width of their palm and all kinds of straight dimensions that I needed. And surprisingly, the average, um, there's an average hand size. And then there's some really small ones and then some very few large ones. Um, and this angle here allows, you know, for some adjustment as well. But all that said, when we're carving, it's nice to have your hand tilted up just a little bit as I'm working. And so that's why the blade is, is a little bit kinked in the handle like so. This one shows it better. Now there's a limit to this, um, which I found out. I'm like, all right, I'm gonna make one really extreme. And what happens is when it's too far up, it just pivots, it just pivots around and you can't, you can't hold it. So, you know, there's a limit on how extreme that bend can be. And then, you know, the back, you know, you could mount these blades, like a lot of the older ones, they had a skew, they had the blade mounted in a skew. And I think that's completely legit. Um, but when you're, when you're carving a wide canoe rib, having a skewed blade and then trying to control thickness of the cut is more complicated because there's a, a diagonal involved with that blade as it skews. So I opted for, uh, a straight blade coming out of my handles. It's easier to see, and especially for, for people who are new to it, they don't have to deal with that extra layer of complexity of having a skewed blade tip across the surface of the wood and be compounded by that angle. 
So there's a couple different answers uh, to the questions in that. Um, and again, there's no rules, but we have to be honest with ourselves. And does it really work well? Or is it, you know, just pride that brings us to the place of, yeah, this is an awesome tool. And it's like, well, maybe it's not. Here's my angle bevel finder. And I don't really keep track of angle bevels that much. I can never keep it straight. Kind of like, I don't know when my birthday is sometimes. <laughs> um, this one's pushing 30, it's like 28. Um, this one's gonna be shallower. So that's like 22, you know, so don't be super specific about that stuff between 20 and 30, probably going to be okay. Species dependent. Let me see what this one is. 25, the new ones are going to be shallow. I like the shallow ones better. I think closer to maybe 25 probably is okay. But again, like, don't get obsessed about math. It's usually when things go awry. Uh, that's 26. More questions? Um, let me see here. It's got to be more. Doesn't look like it. Maybe we'll just wait one more minute and then. Yeah, we yeah. Say goodbye. We're gonna we're gonna wind down. It's been uh, an hour. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed themselves and learned something. Um, hopefully, you'll uh, make a good crooked knife. It doesn't have to follow my protocols, but hopefully, this will give you some insight and some things to think about when you're make, making them. Um, There's a few comments coming in now. Uh, why don't you, why don't you read? read okay. Oh, the single bevel. Uh, it's a single bevel tool. I should have made that clear from the very beginning and maybe I mentioned it, but a single bevel tool, uh, flat down and, and then the bevel up. Um, I usually run a, a little convex on the flat side so that you can control a little bit more. But a full bevel down, you, you're gonna have to accommodate that in your handle shape because your handle's gonna be twisted a little bit because of the bevel. So you could, but you'd have to tweak your handle a little bit more. Oh, the last thing I wanted to mention too is that mm, it's hard to see the, the blade itself is level with the top surface of that triangular cross section. Let me get this knife instead. So the blade here is parallel to this. I have it right there. <laughs> you can see on the uh, chalkboard, the uh, crooked blade and the blade should be oriented to the top surface. That helps just put the palm in a good spot. Okay, have you ever used a good crooked knife made from a farrier knife? Um, the farrier knives tend to be really flat and the handle in line. So they might be a soft steel, you could bend them. Uh, and then the handles aren't set up quite nicely. So you just carve a little flat in it and then it, it will work. My biggest uh, problem with ferro knives is the steel tends to be really bad. It doesn't hold an edge very well. And that little crook on the end um, sort of prevents it from being sharpening all the way. So I'd like, I'd cut that off and then uh, it might work in a pinch, but it's really soft metal. Um, so it can, but there's pros and cons to all of it. How do you sharpen? I sharpen with a, um, well, first off, when I maintain my edges, some of you are gonna freak out about this. So some of the natives, when using these, they would just, they would just burnish their edge 
with another piece of steel, kind of like a scraper. And so what that does is that pushes some of that metal down into, if this is your flat bevel, it pushes the tip of the blade kind of like so and helps it to bite. And it's moving metal because metal isn't necessarily purely solid. You can move that metal a little bit with the burnishing. So that's one way of maintaining the edge is to burnish. The second is um, what I use is a piece of sandpaper wrapped on a wooden dowel. And I use that on the inside. So I had some of that here this morning. You just run, run that sandpaper, wrap it around, and then work it, work the bevel. And then the flat side, you could use any sharpening stone, you know, like normal. Um, can blades be forged in a regular campfire? Mm. Yeah, we didn't talk about forging much and I wanted to touch on it. So this is a good question. Um, uh, yes, they can. Um, <clears throat> it depends. Blacksmithing is a whole nother world to discuss. And when you're dealing with um, high carbon steels, like old files, recycled leaf springs, um, there are some rules that you need to um, follow. Otherwise, you're going to have problems with your, with your steel. Um, <clears throat> and I'll just be really brief. You, you can look this stuff up. It's readily available, but you need to take the hardness out of anything you're salvaging by heating it to where it loses magnetism and then letting it cool slowly. And then after that, you could forge it, like hammer on it. It'll be soft or you could file it or grind it with an electric grinder. Then you need to heat it back up again once you have it shaped. And so a fire will attain, I think, maybe a thousand degrees up to two, uh, 1200 maybe. If you could blast some air in it, you could probably get it up to 1600, just burning wood. And that's enough to heat steel, um, most steels up to that place where it loses its magnetism called critical temperature. And that's where you harden. So you could do it in a campfire, a wood stove. Um, you can take, um, I mean, that's, that's the crude, not the crudest, but the simplest way. You can get into forges and all kinds of stuff and we won't go there, but <clears throat> definitely blow some air in a fire and you can get it, get it really hot. Okay, um, have you made any spoons with them? I haven't. Uh, because the handle, in my opinion, there's better knives for spoons than, than mocha dog and their crooked knives. The Swedish hook knife, seems to be a little bit better. Um, when you're carving, I don't have one with a really extreme hook, but when you're carving like this, you can do it, it's fine. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't, put, I wouldn't put the crank on it. It would just be straight out and maybe a smaller blade. And again, these people had many knives for different tasks. And so um, I wouldn't carve a spoon with this knife. I would make, if I was set to use a crooked knife or Mokotogan, I would make a separate blade that just had a little hook on it and then mounted it to a handle so that you could, you could carve like this or carve away from you. And that's a little bit of, more of a West Coast, <clears throat> Pacific Northwest style of carving. There's a guy on uh, Instagram, In Ingo, who has that style of carving. And, you can watch him. That leads right to the next question, which was, have you done other types of carving? Um, like this person's familiar with the Northwest First People Carvers, mm. Haida, right. Coast Salish. So. Right, that's that's where Ingo's specialty is and, and the native workers up there. Um, a lot of those knives tend to be uh, more used like a for relief carving in soft cedar. So we have to look at materials too, like the historical context of what materials being used because the materials will dictate tool design as well. <clears throat> and a lot of that stuff that they were carving was ornamental relief carving. And a lot of their hook knives, they have lots of different shapes. Um, their 
not always or not entirely and being very general, but used as relief carving gouges, even though they were handled like a knife, they were carving, they're double-sided. And so you could, you could carve in, you know, these giant relief carvings in their totem poles and ornaments in their architecture and, and things like that. So, you know, here they're using cedar and uh, birch and spruce uh, for their for their paddles and um, canoe parts and things like that too. So wood wood plays into it. Was the ladle that you had in the picture was that carved with? Don't know for sure. You can only assume, I guess. There's no way of going back in time. Um, I've seen piles of of feast spoons uh, in the Peabody Museum archives. Um, it would be a great subject for a book, um, but they, it's hard to say for sure. I'm, I'm guessing so. Probably those, those hook, uh, crooked knives with the big hooks on them probably be more for carving uh, spoons and bowls and ladles, but there's no way of knowing for sure. Okay, I think we should wind down. Okay. So let's see, this one, let me make sure. Yeah, okay. All right, everybody, I think we're gonna wind down. Uh oh, a steel question. All people can email you with further questions, okay? Right, um, oh, that's Jeremy. Jeremy, we can talk later about blacksmithing. Um, so we're gonna end it. Um, I hope that everybody enjoyed themselves and learned something. Um, thanks for the donations. Um, a little bit of the news is, you know, I've been teaching all over for a long time and last couple of years, we've been teaching more closer to home and we just closed on a piece of property that will be a school, um, and my workshop. Um, so look for that kind of information coming out soon when we, uh, start communicating about it, but, um, we're already talking to a few uh, a famous, well-known English spoon carver friend of mine, so you may know who I'm talking about, and, and also a Japanese spoon carver. Um, so we're hoping to get some of these uh, instructors and then I'll teach classes as well. So that's some of the donations that you gave are going to that, to that fund that's gonna help get this school off the ground. So thanks a lot, we really appreciate it. Um, I think that's it. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks. Have a good yeah. day, everybody.